but welcome to today's symposium entitled Deciphering Invasive Group A Strap in Adults, Essential Insights for the Emergency Physician. My name is Arielle Hendon. I work as an emergency physician at the Ottawa Hospital and in ICU at the Montfort Hospital. And on behalf of the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians, I'm delighted to be your moderator for what I know will be a very useful and interesting session. Our symposium topic was independently conceived by the Conference Scientific Planning Committee. This program received financial support from Paladin in the form of an education grant. All efforts were made to mitigate any potential biases, and the faculty have declared all potential conflicts of interest. So for a little background on why we settled on this topic, we're all aware of the sharp increase in cases of invasive group A strep infections and the resulting media and public interest in these infections. So it seemed timely to review what invasive group A strep is and how to manage it as well as other non-invasive strep infections. We're excited to share with you some, some recommendations from the soon to be released CAVE guidelines on skin and soft tissue infections led by one of our own presenters, Dr. Yadav. So our learning objectives today are thus as follows. We're going to defend existing management of pharyngitis despite rising rates of invasive group A strep. We'll differentiate the diagnosis and management of simple skin and soft tissue infections from necrotizing fasciitis. We'll integrate new guidelines for assessment and management of skin and soft tissue infections in practice. And then we'll identify evidence and resources regarding infection control precautions and public health measures in the management of close contacts of invasive group A strep cases. It's my pleasure to now introduce our distinguished speaker, speakers. Dr. Sachin Takaya is an adult infectious diseases specialist in Saskatoon. She completed her medical school and internal medicine residency at the University of Saskatchewan, followed by an infectious diseases fellowship in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia. After a short time with the University of Alberta Division of Infectious Diseases, based at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton, Sachin returned to Saskatoon in 2005. From 2020 to 2022, she became the pandemic chief of staff for Saskatoon, involved in COVID leadership with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Thankfully, things are now back to usual with a return to both inpatient and outpatient clinical adult infectious diseases. Dr. Christian Yadav is an associate professor with the Department of Emergency Medicine, University of Ottawa, and associate scientist with the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Christian is a new investigator within the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Ottawa Hospital and currently holds a junior clinical research chair in skin and soft tissue infections with the University of Ottawa Faculty of Medicine. His current research focuses on infectious diseases in the emergency department setting with a focus on improving the care of patients with skin and soft tissue infections. So to frame the content we're going to discuss today, we have a few cases um, that we'll start with. So for your first case, you're working in a community emergency department, and your patient is a 24-year-old man who's healthy with no past medical history. He comes in with three days of subjective fever, a dynophagia, a dry cough, and myalgias. His vitals are fairly unremarkable. He's a little bit tachycardic, but afebrile. And on exam, he appears well. His voice is hoarse. He's got ten tender cervical lymphadenopathy bilaterally. He's got an erythematous oropharynx, but no obvious exudate that you can see. Your site has access to throat culture, but not to rapid strep testing. So how do you manage this patient? And you think there's been a lot of the news about a rise in invasive group A strep, and so should this change your approach to this patient? So it's important to highlight that we're going to focus on an approach to pharyngitis in adults, not in children. The prevalence of bacterial pharyngitis is certainly much higher in children. But in adults, pharyngitis is 80% viral. The remaining 20% is bacterial, of which the majority of that is caused by strep pyogenes. And this is not at all an exhaustive list of the other differentials that should go through your mind when assessing a patient who's got a sore throat. Um, but the bottom line is we prescribe too many antibiotics for sore throat. So I just told you that pharyngitis is 80% viral in adults, and yet 5% of all of our antibiotic prescriptions are for sore throat. And in a recent international systematic review of antibiotic prescriptions for sore throat in Canada, this makes up about seven prescriptions per 100 people per year. And of these prescriptions, 50% were prescribed for proven group A strep, and the other 50% were either negative or were not even tested. And so the question is, I mean, your patient is most likely going to have a viral pharyngitis, but clinically, for the person in front of you, how are you going to differentiate between viral and bacterial? Uh, and this is challenging. Uh, this is a table from the 2012 Infectious Disease uh, Guidelines, the IDSA Guidelines. 
And as you'll see, there's a lot of overlap between the features. There's pretty non-specific features for group A strep infection versus viral infections. There are, however, a few features that are more strongly suggestive of a viral etiology. So if your patient has coryza, cough, if they have a hoarse voice or actual oral ulcers on exam, those are more strongly suggestive of a viral etiology. We do have scoring systems as well, which can help modify our pretest probability of bacterial pharyngitis. So we all know the center criteria. These were derived in 1981, and they're a risk stratification tool designed to predict the likelihood of group A strep causing a patient's sore throat. The modified criteria for age, the MacKaysa criteria, were evaluated in a family medicine setting in Toronto. And because group A strep is more likely in children above the age of three, their criteria adds one point for age three to 14 years. There was a large-scale validation of the modified criteria in 200,000 patients in the U.S. in 2012, again in a non-emergency medicine setting. Um, but this score is still recommended for use in guidelines from the Canadian Pediatric Society and the U.K.'s National Institute for Healthcare Excellence Guidelines in the evaluation of sore throat. So essentially for adults, as the patient's score increases, the likelihood of being group A strep positive goes up. The maximum score an adult can have is four. And the positive test in this study was either rapid strep test, a confirmatory DNA probe, or an actual throat culture. So as you can see, even a center score of four, that's an adult who has fever, no cough, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, and tonsillar exudate, is only going to be group A strep positive in 57% of the cases, which is barely better than half. But this does remain the best predictive tool that we have currently, with an area under the curve of 0.72 in adults. So we've already said that most of pharyngitis is viral, and we don't have great tests to differentiate between the two clinically. The question remains, do patients with strep pharyngitis actually need antibiotics at all? So we know that some of the tests we're going to do will be false positives. Um, about 15% of children will be asymptomatic carriers, less in adults. Uh, so in many patients, we're going to be treating viral pharyngitis and just risking the side effects of antibiotics. We also know from a recent Cochrane review that 80% of patients with sore throat are going to be asymptomatic by one week, even without antibiotics. But what we really think we're treating with antibiotics for strep is complications of strep pharyngitis. So there is a small reduction in superlative complications of strep pharyngitis with antibiotics. These are things like otitis media and peritonsillar abscess. But the incidence of these complications is very low, about 1%. So the number needed to treat to prevent a superlative complication is about 200. Um, and in older studies, antibiotics did prevent uh, things like post strep glomerulonephritis and rheumatic fever. But in our current populations, the rates of these complications are very, very low. Um, and most of our populations that we're treating rheumatic fever isn't really a concern. The one notable exception would be many of our indigenous populations where rates of rheumatic fever are disproportionately high. So just to keep in mind that depending on the patient that you treat, this may be a real concern. So all that said, if we've decided we're going to treat strep pharyngitis, it's really with the goal of preventing the already low rate of superlative complications. We're going to review two sets of guidelines uh, that we have some fairly old IDSA guidelines that haven't been updated since, and the UK NICE guidelines, which are newer. So the IDSA really says clinical features alone are not enough to distinguish between bacterial and viral pharyngitis, um, unless there are strong viral features like we talked about. So the cough, the hoarse voice, oral ulcers on an exam, um, and that you should use some kind of testing if your clinical suspicion is high to prove the patient has strep. Um, this would be in the form of a throat swab or ra rapid antigen test. And they say that the rapid antigen test is specific enough um, that you can consider a positive a positive, but that the rate of group A strep in adults is low enough that if the strep rapid test is negative, then you don't need to proceed with a confirmatory throat culture. You can treat them as not strep. Um, if you are going to treat patients, the treatment would be penicillin or amoxicillin for 10 days. And there are alternatives for patients who are truly penicillin allergic. The UK National Institute for Healthcare Excellence guidelines from 2018 are, are somewhat similar. They also do recommend using some kind of, of pretest probability to decide if you need to treat your patient. Um, so if your center score is zero to two, they say this is low enough, you don't need to treat with antibiotics. If the patient is unwell, reasonable to treat immediately. And if they're a moderate to high probability, they say you can consider treating them 
or giving them a backup prescription if their testing is positive. And again, most patients are going to improve within, within one week regardless of antibiotics or not. So I just want to mention quickly what else can be done for symptom management in sore throat. Both the NICE and the IDSA guidelines do recommend non anti-inflammatory drug use for symptom management, of course. And neither of these guidelines recommend steroids, um, but in RCTs, a single dose of dexamethasone, 10 milligrams, reduces symptom burden at 48 hours in patients with pharyngitis who did not receive antibiotics. And then a Cochrane review from 2020 found that in patients who did receive antibiotics, single dose steroids increased the likelihood of symptom resolution. So your patients, whether they receive antibiotics or not, are shown to have improvement in their time to symptom resolution with steroids. So as I mentioned earlier, there's been an increase in the incidence of invasive group A strep infections, i.e. those in which strep pyogenes is found in a normally sterile site, so the CSF, blood, fascia, or muscle. And these infections have certainly reached the public consciousness and the media, and some of our patients are asking, and I think we as providers are wondering, whether there's a link between group A strep pharyngitis and invasive group A strep. After all, it is the same bacteria, right? However, the strains that cause invasive group A strep typically have virulence factors that allow them to become invasive in susceptible patients. And there's actually no established linkage between pharyngitis and invasive group A strep, which Dr. Takaya will speak more about. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> So I'm Sasha Takai with Infectious Diseases. And just to review, so I get the question a lot, you know, people that have sore throat, they've di been diagnosed with strep throat, and they're like, well, am I going to get nectaris and fasciitis? The answer is generally no. That there is no link established. They also don't know that the, uh, the, the uh, strains that cause phar pharyngitis are the same as those that cause necrotizing um, uh, infections. So. As a general rule, no. There is an actually an excellent meta-analysis that was done in 2023 that kind of looks at that and looks at, is there a link, number one, which they found no, and number two, they actually found that there were some signals, uh, they weren't definitive risk factors, but suggestive that there are, um, there are certain patients that are at increased risk of invasive infection, and those are people that have um, history of varicella infection, so especially little ones that have chicken pox that can predispose them to necrotizing infections later on. Um, NSAID use, whether it's because it's masked or whether it because it alters the uh, inflammatory pathway, can put um, little ones at risk of necrotizing infections. And those with uh, low socioeconomic um, status, sometimes they don't seek attention soon enough, so for that reason they can have an increased risk of uh, invasive infection. So in general, there is no link, um, but of course there's increasing concern with all of this in the media, knowing that you don't necessarily have to be immunocompromised to have these invasive infections. So in general, no. If we're talking about managing pharyngitis, you do not need to change your practice. You would manage pharyngitis the way we do. Does not mean that you have to increase the treatment. Do not have to increase testing. Um, we would follow the guidelines that, that Ariel presented that if you have a low clinical suspicion, probably viral, treat symptomatically. If you think it could be a bacterial cause, test and then treat appropriately. Or if they are more severe, then it would be appropriate to um, pursue empiric ther therapy. So there is no, no definitive link. That being said, though, I just wanted to share some data. So with Within Canada, we know that there is an increasing rate of invasive group A streptococcal infection. So you hear it in the media, it's been in the Canadian news, but it's also an international phenomenon too where we're actually seeing increasing cases of invasive group A strep, and I'll tell you what that's defined as in a minute. So this is PHAC data that was um, provided to me by one of my microbiology colleagues, and this is the rate of invasive infection. So when they talk about invasive infection, that means isolating group A strep from a normally sterile site. So if you look here, um, I don't think I have a pointer here, but 2010 to 2019, there's a general slope upwards, and that was a, general, is a trend that actually is seen globally. We're not sure if it's related to the kind of strep or whether it's related to uh, immunity within the population, but there's a general trend upwards. And then the pandemic hit, so 2020, between 2020 and 2022, you see kind of a downward curve, and they called this a historic fall that they've never seen before. And the belief is because of all the social measures that were taken, a reduction in vi respiratory viral illnesses that are circulating. Because of all that, there was a reduction in the number of invasive group A streptococcal infections. Then everything opened up again, and they found a spike 
in 2023. And this is all, all the different colors. I don't know if you can see that, but it's actually all the different provinces. So nationwide, they found an increase in the number of cases of invasive group A streptococcal infections. Um, 2024 is a small bar because that was, this is February data, so we hadn't accumulated any data beyond that yet. But it is again showing the same trend. We're having an increasing number of cases across the nation. When we talk about invasive group A strep, so this is, that data I showed you before is all from the National Microbiology Laboratory, and they're reporting the number of cases they have of cultures from normally sterile sites. So the confirmed cases are those that have positive strep pyogenes within the blood, pleural space, um, it can be from deep tissue, the normally sterile sites, um, or bone or joint. Um, the probable cases are if they test positive with other things, a rapid test but not a culture, and there's a clinical suspicion that it could be, but those are actually not counted in those national cases. Within the, within the invasive group A strep infections, and this will become more important when we talk about chemoprophylaxis, but there is severe and non-severe. So all of these severe and non-severe invasive group A strep are still isolated from normally sterile sites, but the severe ones have systemic symptoms. So if they, might, they might have toxic shock, they might have septic shock, they'll have necrotizing infections, pneumonia, meningitis, those possibly life-threatening conditions would be considered severe invasive group A strep. And the non-severe are, you can have bacteremia without those septic symptoms, or you could have cellulitis that's really localized, or a skin abscess that's managed. Sometimes you can have osteomyelitis or septic arthritis from group A strep that doesn't necessarily cause a problem. So um, those are considered non-severe, but they're still considered invasive group A strep. So with all of the talk of invasive group A strep, it sounds very scary. Could there be a new super strain out there? You know, after the pandemic, I think we're all on edge about a new bug that's going to, you know, wipe us all out. Um, but they haven't identified anything definitive. So what we're seeing is that there are, so the way group A strep is, is um, categorized, they're, they're called M types. There's different strains. And so M protein is a surface protein, and that's what induces our, our seropositivity. So there's many different ones. There's like over 200 strains of M types. But there's one particular one they're seeing that it's raising um, awareness. It's called the M1 UK strain. And they're finding they f there was actually an outbreak of streptococcal, uh, not streptococcal, sorry. There was an outbreak of scarlet fever in the UK in 2019. And that started to raise flags on what's going on. So scarlet fever is actually not, um, it's not a superlative complication, but it's a strain of streptococcus that has that toxin that can cause that rash, right? The rash, the strawberry tongue, it has features of, of um, more severe streptococcal infection, but not necessarily invasive, um, so if that makes sense. Um, but they did see a signal that there's something going on with the streptococcal strain that they were facing, and they isolated this M1 type. Up to 2023, there were outbreaks elsewhere in the world where they were seeing an increase in cases of invasive group A strep. So they looked at the type of, of strep that was causing the problem. And initially in the in early 2023, they didn't actually see the signal. So they saw increased number of cases, but it wasn't related to the M1 type. Now though, entering late 2023 to 2024, they are actually seeing an association. So now they're seeing that the invasive group A streptococcal infections are actually related to the M1 UK type. So they think that there is an increasing prevalence of this. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is something that we're, um, that's uh, a super bug that's gonna spread and take over the world, but it seems to be the prevalent strain that's causing these invasive problems right now. So this is in Canada. So again, this is PHAC data that was provided by one of my microbiology colleagues, and it shows in Canada we're seeing the same. So 2023, the first half of 2023, there wasn't that signal, but last half of 2023, we are seeing increasing the M1 uh, UK virulent, um, hypervirulent strain, they're calling it. And then 2024, we're actually seeing that spread within Canada as well. The strain itself is, is more potent because it's able to produce a special toxin. So there's a number of different toxins that these um, invasive group A streptococcal strains can produce, but one is called the streptococcal pyogenic uh, exotoxin, and that's what's responsible for that scarlet fever, rash, and, and whatnot. And because of that, um, the, the UK strain, it's a, it, it produces that SPE, but it also has, the SPE has the ability to trigger the immune system in a special way. It's called the super antigen. So it can bypass that, that antigen presenting step and just trigger sort of poly polyclonal activation of the immune system. Inflammatory cascade is triggered very rapidly and that's what causes that invasive infection. 
So although it has the ability to produce that, it doesn't show any change in resistance in the organism. So we're not seeing a, in the sense of an MRSA superbug where there's lots of antibacterial resistance that doesn't exist in this group B strep. And again, there's no link to pharyngitis. So we're seeing the spread, but it doesn't mean it's that the pharyngitis isn't leading to these increasing cases. So just something to, to keep in mind about the bug, although it does sound scary, it doesn't mean that we are facing a new strain of uh, strep out there. Hopefully it'll calm down. We, and we also don't know, as the new strain comes out, we do develop immunity, will this settle down? Those are things that we're, we'll, are yet to be seen. So I'll pass this back to Ariel. Thank you, Dr. Takaya. So in this patient who was well, um, he has several features consistent with a viral pharyngitis. He has a hoarse voice, he's afebrile, he has a cough. His center score is one. You elect to treat him with NSAIDs and a single dose of dexamethasone. Review the expected course with him for viral pharyngitis and you discuss reasons to seek reassessment. For our second case, you have a 62-year-old female you're seeing in a tertiary care emergency department. She has a past history of diabetes and hypertension and she bumped her leg on a coffee table three days ago and two days now, she's had right leg pain and redness. She'd been scratching at the area and had some excoriations prior. Her vitals, as you see, are fairly unremarkable. On exam, she has some lower shin erythema, which is warm and mildly tender on palpation, um, with no crepitus and no bulla. Compartments are soft. She's not confused. There's some nausea, but no vomiting. So how do you approach this patient's management? I'll pass this over to Dr. Yadav. Uh, so this is a nice segue into skin and soft tissue infections. Um, so first, I'm just going to spend a quick moment to convince you about why this is an important problem in the emergency department. Cellulitis is the ninth most common reason Canadians visit an emergency department every single year, and that doesn't even take into account skin abscesses and deeper necrotizing infections. So the burden is likely much higher. We know that from data in the United States, four in 10 Americans visit a healthcare provider every single year for skin and soft tissue infections with an annual cost of five billion US dollars. So this is a huge burden on our healthcare system, on our patients, and economically as well. That being said, when we think about skin and soft tissue infections, we think it's a pretty simple process. But I challenge you that there are actually a number of important pitfalls to consider. So when a patient presents to the emergency department and sees a clinician with a potential skin and soft tissue infection, the first potential pitfall is making an accurate diagnosis. The literature shows that up to one in three patients will be misdiagnosed when they approach a clinician in the emergency department. And this can have unintended consequences such as inappropriate exposure to antibiotics uh, or potentially missing an important alternative diagnosis such as a DVT. However, most of the time we do get the diagnosis correct. And then we have to decide, is this a purulent infection, like a skin abscess? If it is, we typically treat it with a bedside incision and drainage. And then we have to decide, does this patient need antibiotics or not? If it's non-purulent, like cellulitis, it's the age-old question, do we use oral or IV antibiotics? And then the patient that you decide needs IV antibiotics, do they need hospital admission, or can we send them home? And then there's a persistent question about when should these patients get follow-up? Because we know that a substantial number of patients that we see in the emergency department don't have a family doctor. So when should they come back to the emergency department? When should they go to a walk-in clinic, et cetera? So given what I've highlighted, we recognize that there was an opportunity to perhaps improve the care of emergency department patients with skin and soft tissue infections. So we have created the Canadian Emergency Department Best Practices Checklist for Skin and Soft Tissue Infections. This has been fully endorsed by CAPE and has been accepted for publication in CGEM. Uh, it should be out in press in the next four weeks. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on how we develop these recommendations. We did recognize that there are a number of high quality guidelines for skin and soft tissue infections out there, but they're not tailored to the Canadian Emergency Department context. So we followed the CAN implement process to adapt existing high quality guidelines but for use in the Canadian ED setting with a focus on diagnosis, treatment, disposition, and follow-up. And hopefully what you'll see from the recommendations that we have is that these are very concrete recommendations that are directly applicable to you as clinicians at the bedside. Back in January of 2023, we created a steering committee. So you can see the key stakeholders that we involved. Emergency physicians from both urban and rural sites, infectious disease specialists, patient partners, pharmacy, nurse educators, with uh, great support from implementation scientists and methodologists in Ottawa. Uh, 
We first searched the literature for any skin and soft tissue infection guideline published in the last 10 years, and we selected the five guidelines with the highest rigor of development score in the Agree To instrument. So we picked those five guidelines for adaptation to develop our recommendations. So how did we arrive at the recommendations? Well, we developed 24 key health questions across three conditions. The vast majority uh, of our recommendations were adaptations of existing recommendations. If a guideline did not adequately address our question, we then searched the literature for high quality systematic reviews. And then if there wasn't even a systematic review to answer the question, as a steering committee, we developed an expert opinion, which was for three of the 24 questions. So let's dive into some of the recommendations. I can't cover all 24, but I'm gonna cover some key ones. So the diagnosis of cellulitis, as I mentioned, is difficult. One in three patients are, are misdiagnosed if you look at the literature. And that's because there are a large number of both common and uncommon mimics. So we have to think about all of these alternative diagnoses that these patients could potentially have. So the first question we asked is, how should cellulitis be diagnosed in the emergency department? And we recommend using clinical judgment to diagnose cellulitis. In the first point, we've rec we pointed out the key uh, findings of cellulitis that you'll see at the bedside. And we specifically recommend not using specific decision tools or specific investigations to diagnose cellulitis. This was based on a high quality systematic review by Patel et al, where they found that when they looked at biomarkers and decision tools, none of them were sufficiently appropriate enough to, to diagnose cellulitis. So yes, there are a number of mimics and diagnosis can be difficult, but there are things that can point us one way or another. First, cellulitis is almost never bilateral. If you have somebody with bilateral symptoms, you should consider an alternative diagnosis. Mechanism is key, so if in the history there's some sort of story about a microtrauma or skin breach that usually portends that it's a cellulitic process. If there's associated lymphangitis, that's highly suggestive of an infectious process. And finally, if there's an absence of all three, tenderness, induration, and warmth, you should be thinking about an alternative diagnosis. Another question that pops up is that how should blood, cult should blood cultures be ordered for patients with cellulitis? We have data that shows up to 20 to 30% of patients with skin and soft tissue infections have blood cultures sent. We recommend not routinely ordering blood cultures for systemically well patients with cellulitis. This is based on data that shows that in a systemically well patient with this infection, less than 5% of blood cultures are positive. However, we would recommend considering ordering blood cultures if you have a patient who's systemically unwell or immune suppressed, and we put the criteria for what that means in parentheses for you. Something else that often comes up is, should ED clinicians order imaging, such as CT scan, for patients with cellulitis? We recommend not routinely ordering radiology-performed imaging for cellulitis. We expanded the scope of what we meant by imaging to include CT, X-ray, and ultrasound because we recognized that there are many Canadian emergency departments that might have access to only one of those modalities. We do, however, recommend considering obtaining imaging for patients with the following scenarios, suspected osteomyelitis, foreign bodies, or if there's substantial uncertainty in differentiating from necrotizing fasciitis, but with the important caveat that that should never delay urgent surgical consultation if your clinical suspicion is high. So what about treatment of cellulitis? I would argue that the vast majority of patients with cellulitis should be treated with oral antibiotics, and that's because there are a number of advantages over IV antibiotics. It's more convenient for our patients, it's less invasive, it's cheaper, and there are lower rates of complications, with the one disadvantage being not quite hitting 100% bioavailability with an oral antibiotic. So if that's the case, if most of our patients should be treated with oral antibiotics, then the question is, well, when should we treat our patient with IV antibiotics? We recommend treating with IV antibiotics in the following patients. So a patient who's systemically unwell, somebody who's failed oral antibiotics, and we've given a specific definition. So if there's a new or persistent fever, if there's worsening pain, and or spreading erythema despite at least 48 to 72 hours of oral antibiotics. And then we added a third indication that was not in previous guidelines, which is a pretty obvious one, if there's uh, an inability to tolerate oral intake such as vomiting. We've also created antibiotic treatment tables for you, so our team's in the process of creating an app that you'll be able to use at the bedside. And so we list what are first-line oral and IV antibiotic options. And to make it even easier for you as a prescriber, we have thought carefully about those special circumstances with our patients. 
So what do you do about a patient who's penicillin or cephalosporin allergic? What do we do for our patients that are breastfeeding or pregnant, those with kidney impairment, or those with clear MRSA risk factors or concerns? Finally, let's talk about cellulitis disposition. So first we ask which ED patients with cellulitis should be admitted to hospital. We know that this is a big problem. We over-hospitalize patients with cellulitis, and we have shown locally in Ottawa that the cost of admitting a patient for simple cellulitis to the hospital is a, a mean cost of 10,400 Canadian dollars. So we recommend considering hospital admission in patients with any of the following uh, scenarios. So if there are clear challenges with adherence to therapy, if they're immune suppressed, if they've failed outpatient treatment, or if they're systemically unwell. And then this is an important one because we do send most of our patients home when should patients be reassessed by a healthcare provider, right? I just mentioned that a substantial number of our patients don't even have a family doctor. So we could not find any guideline evidence uh, that gave a clear recommendation. The NICE guidelines did recommend uh, between two to three days, but this was based on expert opinions. So we wanted more robust evidence. Uh, there was a meta-analysis that I actually led a few years ago where we looked at the impact of antibiotics over time on clinical response to cellulitis. And that data shows that the best available evidence suggests the optimal time to reassessment is between two and four days. Now, as a steering committee, we felt that 48 hours was too, too early, that patients might return too early, and then we would prematurely escalate therapy to IV antibiotics. So we have recommended that you should ask patients to see a healthcare provider within 72 hours if there is no improvement. However, as an expert opinion, we recommend asking them to come back sooner if there's severe pain that seems unusual or rapidly spreading erythema. So to resolve the case that Ariel introduced, we make the diagnosis in our patient clinically. We do not order any blood tests for our patient. We prescribe them an oral antibiotic, so cefadroxyl or cephaloxin, for example. And then we ask our patient, because they don't have a family doctor, please come back to the emergency department in three days' time if there's no improvement or you think there's a slight worsening. Thank you. So what if you had a patient with a bit of a different flavor? So similar initial case, 62-year-old <clears throat> woman with a history of diabetes and hypertension, but in this case, she bumped her leg three days ago and has had a fairly abrupt onset over the last 24 hours of right leg pain and redness. She's tachycardic, she's a bit hypotensive, she's febrile, and on exam, her anterior lower shin is erythematous and warm with some induration and edema, and with pain that seems out of proportion to what the leg looks like on your actual exam. Compartments are soft. And so how do you approach this patient's management differently? So a seemingly similar case, but some big concerns, right? The acuity of their presentation, the vital signs, and especially the physical exam findings. So we're going to talk a little bit about necrotizing fasciitis, which has three subtypes, type 1 being polymicrobial, type 2 is usually single organism, usually group A strep, and then you can get type 3, which is a clostridial gas gangrene. And the reason we care about these infections so much is that one in three patients that we make this diagnosis with will, will die. And so we have to first think about risk factors for necrotizing processes. So one of them is trauma. So if there's a deep crush or penetrating injury, clostridial infections can seed. If there's a penetrating injury with exposure to fresh or salt water, you can get a necrotizing process. But even seemingly minor processes such as a muscle strain or contusion have been known to lead to a necrotizing process. Another important risk factor to consider in your patient is immune suppression. So diabetic patients with peripheral arterial disease, neutropenic patients, those that have had prior organ transplants, and a special case is colon cancer. So colon cancer patients are at high risk for uh, Clostridium septicum infection. So the CT images are from a patient I've seen that had uh, gas forming within the liver. Other important risk factors are uh, pregnancy, uh, childbirth, injection drug use, the post-operative period, and, and insect bites as well. But you can also have a number of patients that develop these infections without any of these risk factors. So that puts us in a conundrum because I would argue that aside from initiating treatment, the single most important thing we can do as emergency clinicians is know when to highly suspect this process. So that was our first question is when should the ED physician consider or highly suspect a diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. We adapted the IDSA guidelines for this. We have recommended using clinical judgment uh, to decide if necrotizing fasciitis should be suspected. Um, and we have listed a number of criteria there. So pain out of proportion, 
crepitus, bullae, necrosis, or signs of systemic toxicity often associated with altered mental status. Now, the IDSA guidelines had an eighth criteria, which was failure of initial antibiotic therapy, and we removed that because we recognize that there are a number of patients with soft tissue infections that we start on antibiotics that might not respond. That doesn't necessarily mean they have a necrotizing process. Another thing that we ask often as clinicians is radiology and lab tests for these patients as well. So let's first talk about imaging. Is there a role for radiologic investigation uh, for necrotizing infections? We recommend not relying on imaging to help diagnose necrotizing fasciitis. We reemphasize the need to rely on clinical judgment. Um, and um, we make these recommendations because we recognize that the definitive diagnosis is actually made in the operating room. What about lab investigations? So we do recommend obtaining wound swabs if appropriate. So what we mean by that is if there's a deep ulcer or a skin abscess that you can actually swab, that is actually very helpful. And also blood culture should be sent for all of these patients. But we do not recommend using any decision tools, specifically the laboratory risk indicator for necrotizing fasciitis, uh, to rule out the diagnosis because it's poorly sensitive. As a reminder, the LRNAC score is a scoring system that consists of six blood tests, where a score of eight or higher is considered high risk for necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, there was an excellent meta-analysis, the senior author sitting over there, Dr. Perry, uh, that they looked at how accurate are the physical exam findings, LRNX score, and imaging tests to diagnose necrotizing fasciitis. And this uh, included nearly 6,000 patients over 23 studies. So I've just summarized the results here simply to highlight that no sign or imaging test or scoring system is sufficiently sensitive to rule out necrotizing fasciitis. So our bottom line is rely on your own clinical suspicion, and if suspicion is high, an immediate surgical consultation is warranted. So finally, let's just talk about uh, initial appropriate ED management of these patients. We recommend immediate surgical consultation, ordering intravenous antibiotic therapy, which I'll cover in the next slide, and also we have mentioned analgesia, IV fluids, and vasopressors if needed, which has not been mentioned in previous guidelines, but is important in the emergency department setting. This is the treatment table for necrotizing fasciitis. First line would be piperacillin and tazobactam. Clindamycin is very important because of the antitoxin properties that it carries, and then vancomycin as well. If you have a patient with anaphylaxis to penicillins, then a carbapenem could be used as an alternative. So to resolve this case, we make the suspected diagnosis based on the clinical exam, obtain an immediate surgical consult, and start triple intravenous antibiotic therapy. We give our patients IV fluids, but they're not uh, well responsive to that. So we start vasopressors, and the surgeon takes the patient to the OR and makes the definitive diagnosis, and then they're transferred to the ICU. Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Uh, so for our third case, as mentioned, the patient goes to the operating room as in, is admitted to hospital. You're on your next shift the following day, and you get a quality assurance call from the microbiology lab who says the blood cultures that you asked for yesterday are positive for strep pyogenes. On your same shift, the patient's niece comes to the emergency department. She's heard her aunt is sick in hospital and with flesh-eating disease, and she wants to be seen. She says, I don't want what my aunt has. So the questions are, what are our reporting requirements for invasive group A strep? How do we as healthcare providers protect ourselves? And what's the role for chemoprophylaxis in close contacts who may have had exposure? Okay, thank you. So just to uh, go through some of the chemoprophylaxis, so there, there's always a panic, whether it's, you know, Neisseria meningitidis or group A strep, you hear that somebody that you've looked after is positive and you wonder, well, do I need to, to take some antibiotics for chemoprophylaxis? In this case, it's a close relative that's concerned that she may, she may contract it as well. We know that um, certain strains, as I mentioned, are, are, um, are, are linked to invasive group A strep disease. Um, and they're not necessarily pharyngeal. They, they have the, the uh, virulence factors that cause invasive disease. And those patients that get invasive group A strep, if there's a secondary case, they're at, if there's an exposure, there's about 100 times risk of them getting severe necrotizing infection 
if they become sick with it. So there is a purpose to chemoprophylaxis of close contacts. The key here, though, is that they must be close contacts. And I'll go through those definitions in a minute. Um, because the case fatality rate is high, we want to make sure that secondary cases do not occur. And so we do define it closely. Public health is generally involved. In Saskatchewan here, those positive cultures actually get called to public health. And then they do some of the contact tracing and then the chemoprophylaxis prescribing. Um, the communicability period is anywhere from 10 to 21 days but we do offer chemoprophylaxis to those close contacts of severe infectious, or severe invasive group A strep infections. Um, any time, if they've been fr seven days from the last exposure up to 24 hours of appropriate antibiotic therapy. So that's their kind of contagious period of that case. Um, but again, the emphasis is only for the severe cases and for the very close contacts. So the close contact definition has been defined. Um, these are all fairly old definitions, and they still stand true. So if you look at the CDC guidance, this is the PHAC guidance, the close, close, uh, close contact um, case definitions are, are, are still the same as many years ago. I think this was put out in 2006. So it, it is household contacts, and you do have to have about four hours of contact per day or 20 hours a week. And, um, outside of the close contacts, so household contacts, the non non-household contacts would include those that have mucosal exposure. So if you had sexual contact, if you've had non-protected or non-PPE mucosal exposure, then those are the ones that, that you would consider chemoprophylaxis for. Usually in the group setting, so long-term care, uh, daycares, schools, not usually recommended unless um, defined by special, the, the same standards. So if you have infant daycare where there's a lot of muco potential mucosal transmission or exposure, those cases there might be some chemoprophylaxis involved. The treatment that they recommend is uh, usually similar to the treatment of pharyngitis, so it would be a 10-day course of uh, cephalosporin. Um, penicillins can be used, but there were a few studies that suggested that carriage is better eradicated with the cephalosporins and something to do with the stability of the beta-lactam. Um, if you're allergic to penicillins, then erythromycin, clarithromycin, clindamycin are alternatives. For, for us as healthcare workers, though, it's important to remember that we wear PPE. So generally, we do not need chemoprophylaxis. So um, the transmission is droplet contact. We won't have those, those lab results yet. As emergency physicians, you might not know that it's group A strap. But if there is a risk of contagiousness and they have that, that flag, usually they're thrown on precautions preemptively. So um, droplet contact precautions, they remain on precautions until 24 hours after appropriate antimicrobial therapy. So as long as you're wearing PPE, you should not be concerned about, about um, chemoprophylaxis. Um, but I often get the question, well, how do you know? Like, what? how do I know what I should be wearing when I don't know what the diagnosis is? And this is a, a key um, infection control, I guess, dogma that we have across the country. It's called point of care risk assessment or POCRA. And I think this is emphasized even further through COVID where we know that you have to be protected before you walk in and, and see that patient because you don't know exactly what they may have. So looking at the patient, what sort of symptoms do they have? What is your task as a physician? What are you going to be doing for the patient? Are you going to be handling bodily fluids? Um, are, is the patient going to be coughing in your face? Those sorts of things all determine what sort of PPE you should be wearing. So do you, need a, do you need a face shield? Do you need a gown and gloves? So the point of care risk assessment is critical in, in all interactions with emerge, not just invasive group A strap. So just to keep that in mind that as healthcare workers, because we are generally protected, um, we don't need to consider chemoprophylaxis. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much to Dr. Takaya and Dr. Yadav. Um, so just to review some take home points. Although invasive group A strep infections are on the rise, the management of actual pharyngitis should still remain unchanged for us. For cellulitis, with the guidelines that Dr. Yadav has reviewed, it's really a clinical diagnosis. In most patients, oral antibiotics would be your preferred treatment, and patients should be reassessed at that 72-hour mark if they're not getting better or if they're actually worsening. For necrotizing fasciitis, again, you need to use your clinical suspicion. And if you're worried, this should warrant an immediate surgical consult with IV antibiotics, analgesia, fluids, and pressors if the patient needs it. And only close contacts, which would not really be healthcare providers as long as we're wearing appropriate PPE, require chemoprophylaxis for cases of invasive group A strep infection. I think we're happy to take questions at this point. Thanks very much to both of you. Thank you. And
I should just point out there are a couple of mics uh, on stands if you're willing to, or unless you're willing to really project. Check, check. Uh, I'm s Hi. Uh, sorry, I'm Sam Mosier. I'm a family and eMERGE doc in Nova Scotia. Um, really appreciate the talk this morning. One of the hospitals I work at in Yarmouth is, uh, well, it made the national news for an eye gas scare, so this is very salient. Um, I was wondering if uh, you could talk, though, um, I, I really appreciate you, uh, especially Dr. Yedev, there addressing the question of like IV versus oral antibiotics for cellulitis, and certainly that's a decision we're making multiple times a day. I'm um, wondering if you had any suggestions in terms of when to step down, right? The patients that we, let's say, we put them on IV, um, uh, cefazolin, you know, probenicid, Q24 for three days, then reassess by MD. I mean, certainly at a lot of uh, facilities, that's going to be a fairly common scenario. Um, and then you decide, okay, is it time to step down or not? And I feel like that's always very much a gestalt sort of judgment call, and I'd love to know if there's anything specific that we could refer to in making that decision. That's a great question. Um, I would strongly advocate for photo documentation. Um, now, you might not have that, right? You might work in an emergency department where you don't have an EMR, where you can take a photo of the patient's infection. But most of our patients will have a cell phone. So just, a just ask them, look, I'm going to take a picture of your infection, because if you come back, the next physician's going to know what to do. Because I think that's a huge challenge, right? The patient comes back, and you have no idea what it looked like a few days ago. Um, the other thing you want to think about, pain, is actually a pretty sensitive marker of worsening or improvement. So if there's a substantial improvement in pain, uh, and their vital signs are normal, um, I would advocate for stepping down as quickly as possible. Hi, Joe Vipon from Calgary, Alberta. Um, so you mentioned that there's a bunch of viral infections that can predispose to invasive group A strep, including, I think, varicella and um, influenza. And then you mentioned that there's been an increase since the pandemic. So do we have any evidence that COVID viral infections can increase the risk of this? Um, I'm going to say we don't have evidence, no. There seems to be a general trend that, um, and we're not entirely sure what COVID does to the immune system. I think there's a lot of hypotheses and theories that it actually does immunomodulate in a way. And so um, there was an increase in, well, actually, we didn't see an increase in bacterial pneumonias necessarily. So those that got COVID, bacterial pneumonias were a, a consequence or, or um, I should say a complication, but it wasn't a given that those with COVID would get that. And the strain, as you know, has changed over time. Um, there is a general trend, though, that those that had a respiratory infection were at increased risk of a secondary bacterial complication, one of which is invasive group A strep. So um, the only thing that was suggestive in that meta-analysis review was varicella, probably because it affects the skin directly. Um, as far as pneumonias go in general, I, you know, the, the classic presentation is actually staph with influenza or predisposed um, viral pneumonias. So I don't know that that association is, is clear, but there does seem to be something about post-pandemic, maybe are the uh, immune waning that happened with all of the isolation. We have a population that's generally more susceptible now to respiratory infections, and that seems to be setting people up for bacterial secondary infections in general. I haven't seen any studies to link COVID specifically to invasive group based strep in the reading that I did, but um, I know that there's kind of this big question mark of what exactly does, did COVID do to our immunity? And um, I'm not sure that we have a definite answer on that. Hi there. I'm uh, Sass Devon from Sunnybrook and from Toronto. Congratulations on this paper. It's fantastic. It's, it's, it's needed. And um, in our centre, unfortunately, we've had almost a case a week for the last 15 months or so. Um, and being the uh, uh, regional burn center, we often get the referrals for complex necrotizing soft tissue infections. And so we're, we're, we're putting a paper together right now, and we're going through the revision stage, and, and I've quoted Jeff Perry's paper many times in this, uh, and, and, and I'm looking forward to citing your paper. Uh, one of the things that, um, that we found is, is to your point, which is the symptomology and the signs are actually very variable. And we've had a, you know, we've had a bunch of patients, one of them, where there was no cutaneous symptoms. It was just pain. And this patient was young and lost his leg and eventually died. Um, we've had other patients where we talk about hyponatremia and we talk about 
um, elevated white count, and we've had a patient where that wasn't the case, and yet significant strep-related necrotizing soft tissue infection. So to your point, it's, it's the, they're all not that sensitive, and, um, and, and the fact that you've highlighted that is, is, is really something that we all should kind of think about, and the point is that we have to think about necrotizing soft tissue infection for us to get there, as opposed to kind of relying on the LRI neck score or, or some sort of scoring system or, or, or some sort of formula, which this clearly is not. Um, and the other thing is that we often, especially if they're so sick, we do give them IVIG, um, just in terms of uh, a strep to uh, toxic shock syndrome. Um, but, but yeah, your paper is very well timed and congratulations. Thank you. Um, I think uh, you make an excellent point, right? I, I'd like to think about necrotizing infections as a spectrum of illness. So that's why we have advocated about not relying on imaging, because you just might be imaging that patient too early in their disease process, such that you don't see those obvious findings that you might if somebody was at a much more advanced or obvious case. Hi, uh, I'm Savannah Bouton. I'm one of the R5s in Saskatoon here. Um, I was just wondering what the recommendation is right now regarding IVIG use for these suspected um, invasive group-based strep infections. Um, so I can tell you that the Canadian Pediatric Society does recommend giving IVIG in invasive group-based strep infections. Um, in retrospective studies, it does reduce mortality. It's a blood product, so we may not have immediate access to it in the emergency department, but it is recommended for those retrospective uh, mortality benefits. Sorry, second question. What if, you, what if it turns out to be a staph infection and not strep? I was just going to say that, that it is only shown for group A strep. Um, we do see necrotizing fasciitis monomicrobial type 2 with MRSA. I've seen a couple of those. Staph aureus, MSSA can all cause those, but there's no evidence to say that the um, IVIG will help in those scenarios. So it really is just for strep toxic shock. Hi, uh, congrats for your great talk. Simon Bertolo from uh, the Schul, Université Laval. Uh, my, my question is for uh, Dr. Yadav. Um, should the location or area of the cellulite is be considered in uh, determining between IV and PO antibiotics? Because there are some evidence given from the location for fingers, for instance, or face, or the, the area. There were some paper on this. I was wondering if you found something in your that's a really good question. Um, it's really hard. There, we could not find any direct link between the location of cellulitis and saying, okay, this person needs IV therapy. Um, hand infections are an interesting one. The physical exam is just really important there because it, you can quite easily tell if somebody has a very advanced infection, maybe developing a flexor tenosynovitis, et cetera, um, but we could not find a link. So we've, at least at this point, iteration of the guideline, we have steered away from talking about location of infection. Uh, my team is working on trials where we're comparing antibiotic doses and we're stratifying based on location to see if there's, you know, an increased rate of treatment failure, for example, with oral antibiotics if the location is not involving the lower limb. And uh, what about the, the area, the... Yeah, the area of erythema is a very subjective thing. Again, we could not find anything uh, clear in the evidence to say, okay, if it's this large, therefore you should use IV antibiotics. So um, we wanted to keep our recommendations very simple, but founded in strong evidence as well. And our team, and I'm sure there'll be other teams out there continuing to do research in this area. And if, if the things change, we can update the guidelines. Hi there, thank you so much. Uh, Paul Atkinson from St. John. Um, it's a, another question for Krishna. Um, by the way, I did get my coffee this morning. Um, you wrote a paper in CGEM um, where you advocated or supported the use of POCUS, um, but now we're seeing that no investigation should be um, instituted. So uh, a pretty simple question, are you including POCUS as an investigation or part of the clinical assessment? Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we were very specific in our wording where we talked about radiology-performed imaging. Uh, we do have direct recommendations where we do recommend POCUS uh, in the skin abscess section. So if you have a patient where there's uncertainty about whether there's an underlying purulent infection, our guideline does recommend using POCUS to help you differentiate. It's got a very high sensitivity.
Hi there, thanks so much for that presentation. Uh, Robin Clouston from uh, St. John. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you can help me. We, I work in a center where uh, it's often really challenging to get a surgical specialist to attend the hospital in the middle of the night. Um, some of our centers are rural and require EMS transfer uh, for a surgical assessment. And on weekends, our uh, plastic surgery coverage is provincial. And so even if I'm in my major center, I might have to transfer the patient uh, to the, the sub-surgical specialist. And often the, and when I've had these conversations, often the conversation is, okay, start the antibiotics and I'll see them in the morning. So can you give, can you help me to maybe with evidence or, um, uh, you know, what is the harm in, uh, in that delayed uh, surgical assessment? What is the harm, for example, in delayed um, uh, OR? Uh, in the setting where you've already started the antibiotics. I couldn't quote any specific evidence in that specific scenario where you've started antibiotic therapy. I can just tell you that locally we have very um, strong protocols where we say the time to bedside assessment is usually between 30 and 60 minutes. Okay. Um, now we're lucky in the sense that this, we've got the, the consultants on site um, to do that. Um, I've spoken to some emergency physicians that work at community sites where there's that struggle, right? You're putting in a critical and the, the surgeon's not excited about the case or doesn't think that they need to be seen. What I've sort of said is, look, give us a call, right, at the, at the urban center and just directly transfer to the emergency department because they just, they ultimately just need to get seen, right? I, anecdotally, I mean, I don't know if uh, Sachin or Ariel have other opinions, but I, I think it's clear that the delay to surgical time in the OR is directly linked to mortality. Thanks very much. Yeah, I would say the same. In, in fact, um you can see the deterioration, right? So those of you that have dealt with a neck fascia infection, it's like they, they kind of progress before your eyes. If they're not hypotensive when you see them, they'll be hypotensive in an hour. So I think it becomes fairly urgent. Um, and that, that delay obviously will increase the risk of mortality. And the amount of tissue they have to take off because of the delay increases as well. Um, the cases that have been delayed that I've been involved with end up um, with, with very bad outcomes for sure. But it is a struggle, and for us in Saskatoon, our struggle isn't so much um, getting the specialists, it's like there's a little bit of a battle between which specialists do we have to call? So I don't know if you have that in other centers, but you know, plastics is the arm and ortho is the leg, and um, there's a little bit of a, a push and pull, but ultimately we need a surgeon to come down and, and have a look, so. All right, thanks um, so much to everyone. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, okay. So, so just just because we, we are going through a revision process and I had to address exactly that question that was just asked about mortality and time. So uh, the suggested guidelines is six hours that they should be, that's where they get the most uh, mortality benefit. So if they're past six hours, it's about 35 to 40%. If they can get to the OR within six hours, it's about 20%. So you almost half the mortality if they can get within six hours of uh, presentation. Thank you so much for everyone for your engagement with the questions and thanks very much for Dr. Takaya and Dr. Yadav for this informative talk with your expertise. I think you provide us all with some pearls and tips for management of patients with these infections. I'd also like to thank everyone who woke up early today to attend this session, the Scientific Planning Committee for their invaluable input, the CAFE staff team for their work behind the scenes, and our IT support for their flexibility. And just a reminder, the session has been accredited by the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Royal College, so don't forget to complete your evaluation to claim your credits. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks again to the speakers. That was fantastic. Uh, and a plea to please fill out the evaluations on the app. Uh, it really drives uh, future talks, topics, speakers, and all of that good stuff. So thanks again. Good morning, everyone. Please take a moment to grab your coffees, grab your seats after the last fantastic session. <laughs>